David, he says, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses. But yet we will boast in the name of Yahweh our God. They have bowed down and they have fallen, but we have risen and we have stood upright. Save Yahweh. May the king answer us in this day we call. Let's stand this morning. Let's sing to Yahweh.
Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here. It's, uh, it's worship day. If you're visiting with us, maybe you're here for the first time, what I'd ask you to do is to take a, a guest card in the pew in front of you, fill that out, and put it in the offering box on your way out. And some people say, well, why do you have an offering box? Well, because it holds more than the little plates you pass, okay? <laughs> it holds more. You say, well, do you really want people to give more? Well, we want, we want to give you everything, right? We desire what God desires, is that he has all of you, Right? Uh, and that you love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But that would be your gift to us, and we'll just send you a little information about the church. But we are glad you're here. Where else would you rather be? I mean, it's Sunday, and it's worship day, and we're together as a family singing truth, and we're going to study truth. We've already had small groups this morning. We'll have more tonight. Um, so we are, we're glad you're here. It's a great day. We have a great week planned, a couple announcements just to let you know about um, on Tuesday, the ladies, the, the book club, uh, is meeting at, at our house. Uh, Jenny will lead that at uh, 6 o'clock. Bring your Bible, bring your book and your notes. Uh, be at our house Tuesday night. Have a good time um, uh, discussing that. Uh, Wednesday night, of course, we have our midweek Bible study. Beaver Kids, 6 o'clock, we'll feed the kids. 6.30, the adults will eat. Um, for the adults, it's $5 a, a plate. You have a, a good home-cooked meal, and that money that we make off that goes to uh, Niku Strimpton, um, Liberty Baptist Church in Tigamoos, Romania, and the camps they do for the summer. But we do a Bible study. If you don't know how to study the Bible, we'd love for you to come on Wednesday night if you're an adult and you can learn how to study the Bible as we study through First Thessalonians. But that's Wednesday night. And then, of course, this weekend is our wildlife supper, Saturday, 6 o'clock. It's a, an outreach event for our church. Um, we'll have a wildlife supper. Um, this is what's going to happen Thursday. If some of you have, are going to bring uh, some of your venison, some of your deer, we'll ask you to do that Thursday night. The, the church, the family life center, will be open. Uh, we'll have that here. Begin to prepare that Friday night. We'll ask all of you, if you're a part of our church, to, to come and be a part of setting up and getting ready. We'll prep for the, the do the food prep. We'll set up. A lot of things will take place on Friday night. We always have food here. We're probably going to fry some fish. We have some gumbo coming. Um, we'll cook some duck, and it'll be fun. But it's a sweet, sweet time. Friday night, you ought to be here. Um, we'll, we'll start doing that about 6, 6.30, but uh, something for everybody. And then, of course, Saturday, 6 o'clock. Yes, sir? Uh, anybody that wants to prepare something, you're welcome to bring a dish of any kind. Yeah, try to bring those desserts if you can. Try to bring them up here. Uh, make sure we're going to have enough about 5 o'clock. And um, if you've got something, some ingredients, something you need from us, just let, let Mr. Bobby know, and we'll get that to you this week. But one of the things we'll ask you to do, uh, just as a church family, is just bring somebody. And it, it, it's an outreach. And somebody that maybe that doesn't go to church, um, someone that you, you're not sure if they know the Lord or not, bring them. Uh, Scott Plath uh, is going to be here. He's one of our partnering church pastors he's coming driving in from idaho he's going to get here thursday uh, we think and he'll be here all weekend he's actually going to preach for us next sunday morning as well but he is going to be here and he's going to teach god's word share the gospel it's going to be a sweet time but the, the purpose of all of this there's a lot of good that comes out of it but the main purpose is of course to be able to share the gospel people need to hear it so if you have a friend uh someone you think might would enjoy that we ask you to you would come I have a, a note of thanks from uh, Karen uh, Morgan. Thanks for all the men that came and cleaned up after the tree fell. She had a tree fall and all the mayhem that happened this week and tore her electric box off her house. She didn't have electricity, but it's all uh, repaired. A lot of uh, men went over there, and she names a bunch of them. I'm going to say thank you for all you men. You know who you are for going and helping her, uh, the church being the church. So, um, Kind of segue into our missions moment. We're going to just take a moment just to pray uh, and ask the Lord for grace as we prepare this week for this supper on Saturday night. It's going to be a real sweet time. But let's just pray and ask the Lord to bless it, that um, he would prepare the hearts of people that come and he would providentially bring who uh, he wants to be there. Uh, so let's do that. Father, we thank you that you give us grace and mercy. 
thank you that you have, for your church, you have bought us, you have called us to yourself, given us eternal life. But Father, we recognize as we wallow in your goodness, we recognize there are a lot of people in our community that have yet to trust Christ. There's a lot of lost people with no hope in our midst, in our community. And we just ask that you would use Saturday. Lord, for the edification of the church, that we'd have a sweet time of fellowship, uh, a great time being together, using their gifts. But Father, we also ask that you would bring people uh, that they would be loved on by our church. And as people come through the door, they would get uh, a warm uh, handshake, a greeting that our church family would pour into um, uh, the people that come. And Lord, they would have a wonderful experience at, here at our church. And Lord, they would hear the gospel as Scott preaches. And that, Father, you would use that to draw them to yourself. Father, we're asking that you would save people. Saturday night, may people come and be saved because they heard the wonderful gospel message. Do a work. Bless us as we, uh, as we work and as we labor. But Father, may you do a work on Saturday night. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. I love being at Beaver Baptist Church. I love seeing all you guys every Sunday. And, you know, the first... <laughs> The first time that we, we've been coming to Beaver for a little over a year, and the first time that uh, I saw that the church was going to do time of confession, uh, it, it freaked me out a little bit. I was like, what, what's, what are we about to do? What's happening here? Time of confession. So I wasn't too excited about, you know, sharing all of my failures and sins and all those uh, other words we like to use in place of the word sin against God, you know, mistakes and errors and that kind of thing. So when I saw what was actually happening, I was a little bit relieved, you know, because, I mean, is there anybody here that you would like to share with me all of your sins that you committed this week? Would you, would you like to, Pastor? No, no, no. And I, I, I certainly don't, because you would be, you, you would question everything. <laughs> you would question, uh, should this guy be attending here, right? Um, but that is one of my favorite things, personally, about the Lord. You see that He knows me and He knows you better than anybody. Amen. My wife knows me very well. I can't get, a, can't get by with much with her. And with God, I can't get by with anything. And despite that, He still loved me enough to die for me, Amen. to die in my place and and the same for you i love that about god that i can take anything to him and he doesn't uh act disgusted he doesn't condemn me but he loves me and he encourages me to keep coming back it says in the scripture that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins today we're here and in just a moment i'm going to go silent while we all pray and confess our sins to him and then I'll pray to, to close us out. But this morning, we're here together in Tipton County, Tennessee, a little small part of western Tennessee, free to worship God, free to listen to his word, free to confess our sins. And we've got brothers and sisters today that are fighting in a war for their freedom and fighting just to have church. And uh, we, we should remember them this morning. I'm so thankful to be right here this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you hear us. I'm thankful that you hear us when we pray in the name of Jesus. I'm thankful that you are a faithful God. I thank you, Lord, that this is not about me. It's not about us. I thank you that it is about your glory. And I thank you for this church and for our 
being able to gather here together today to worship you and to hear your word. God, I ask that you would forgive me of my many sins. For all the many times, even just this week, that I've failed you, I've sinned against your word, and I pray that you would wash me clean in the blood of Jesus. Draw me close to you. Draw us all closer together as you draw us close to yourself this morning, Lord. We love you, and I pray that as we get ready to sing, you would be honored with our praise, that you would be lifted up, and that Everyone here would not be distracted by everything that's going on, maybe after church or what they've got going on this week, but we would be able to focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stay with us. We sing about our redeemer.
reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 28. That's page 80 in your Black Pew Bibles. Exodus chapter 28. I'd ask you to stand as we read his word this morning. Then bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, for holy and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill, that they will make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make. A breast piece an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker wood, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons to serve me as priest. 
They shall receive gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, and scarlet yarns, and of fine twine linen skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that, so that it may be joined together. And the skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it and be of one piece with it, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on the one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod of, of, as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. You shall make settings of gold filigree and two chains of pure gold twisted like cords, and you shall attach the corded chains to the settings. You shall make a breast piece of judgment and skilled work. In the style of the ephod, you shall make it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen, you shall make it. It shall be square and double to span its length and to span its breadth. You shall set up in it four rows of stones, a row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle shall be the first row, row, and the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, and the third row, a jacent, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold filigree, and they shall be of twelve stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its name, for the twelve tribes. You shall make for the breastpiece twisted chains like cords of pure gold, and you shall make for the breastpiece two rings of gold, and put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece, and you shall put the two cords of gold in the two rings at the edges of the breastpiece. The two ends of the two cords you shall attach to the two set to the to the two settings of filigree, and so attach it to the front to the shoulder pieces of the ephod. You shall make two rings of gold and put them at the two ends of the breast piece and on its inside edge next to the ephod. You shall, you shall make two rings of gold and attach them in front to the lower part of the two shoulder pieces of the ephod and its seam above the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And they shall bind the breast piece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue so that it may lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, so that the breast piece shall not come loose from the ephod. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breast piece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance of the Lord. And in the breast piece of judgment you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. He shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. It shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it with a woven binding around the opening like the opening in a garment so that it may not tear. On its hem you shall make pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet yarns around its hem with bells of gold between them. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he does not die. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it to the turban by a cord of blue and it shall be on the front of the turban. And it shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. You shall weave the coat in checkerwood of fine linen, 
and you shall make a turban of fine linen, and you shall make a sash of embroidered with uh, sash embroidered with needlework. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and beauty, and you shall put them on Aaron your brother and on his sons with him, and shall anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. You shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh, that they reach from their hips to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of, of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. This shall be a statute forever for him and for his offspring after him. Remain standing, please. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, he will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus.
that clip that you just saw is, uh, of course, the same song. You recognize the melody. That's Ukrainian believers singing that same song, worshiping the Lord. So we want to be prayerful for the church and all that's going on in Ukraine. Uh, Hearts should be heavy for all those that are displaced, as we mentioned before, Niku and there in Tigamorsk, Romania, they're going to be taking in some refugees from Ukraine. So we want to be in prayer for that church. All that's going on. What a blessing it is to be in our country and have the freedoms and the safeties and all the graces that we have today. May we not take that for granted. When I ask our children second grade and under to come and line up at the door our children's church teacher come and ready to teach the kids as they're coming i want to mention a, a couple of other needs in our church yesterday I spent the afternoon with mr cc simmons he's in the hospital he's in a step down unit he was in icu in the step down unit and spent time with he and missy and he's not doing real well He's, um, of course, he has leukemia, has a lot of other issues going on, but just pray for him that God would be gracious to him and he would persevere in his faith and uh, just pray for him. Also, um, for Mr. Dolores Jones, she had a stroke last week, went and visited her in her home and um, affected her speech and then got a call this morning from her son, Patrick. She's at the hospital and not doing real well, trying to blood pressure and everything the heart rate is uh, not stable so we'll lift those up uh, to the Lord and ask for help so let's do that as we get ready to study father we acknowledge that we are blessed and every good thing we have comes from you and that includes our health father we're here able to study sing and worship together and father we do lift up the the church in the Ukraine as they're being displaced and a lot of uncertainty there. Some are in harm's way. Some are separated from family members. We ask for grace and mercy that your light would shine bright amidst all the darkness. We ask that you would be gracious, that that church would be bold in the midst of a lot of uncertainty a lot of fear may the church be bold in its witness of sharing the good news of Jesus Father for Mr. C.C. we pray for him and ask that you would help him persevere in his faith Father he would draw near to you for Mr. Loris Father we ask for her Lord that her heart rate would stable blood pressure would stabilize we ask for grace for her even now father pray that you would draw her to yourself we pray in jesus name amen, amen. well turn in your bibles back to exodus chapter 28 if you don't have a bible uh, the black pew bible there page 80 appreciate jeff reading that for us too long passage to read, but that's our teaching text this morning. It was originally going to be 28 and 29, but uh, I'm just not going to be able to get through 29, so we're going to look at 28 this morning, and then um, week after next, we'll get to um, chapter 29. You know, things in, here in our con country, in our culture, are getting less and less formal. Uh, we were gone for 10, 11 years and come back and you attend funerals and people aren't wearing suits and ties as much. In fact, I, I do a lot of funerals. I preach a lot of funerals and there's oftentimes I don't wear a tie. Um, it depends on who it is. I always carry one. and uh, But um, I figure if the grandkids are wearing a, a, a ball cap in the worship service, they're not really worried about if I've got a tie on or not. Uh, but we see our culture is changing, and things are a lot less formal. I look around, and 
we don't have many wearing suit coats and ties in our congregation, but many of you grew up doing just that. And um, in fact, when I came to this church, my predecessor pastor was for me, Dr. Kilpatrick, he always wore a suit and tie. And so that was one of the questions that I asked when I decided I was going to pastor this church. Like, okay, tell me what you want me to wear. I wear a suit and tie every time you see me if that's what you want. I just need to know what the expectations uh, are. And I was um, somewhat relieved when they said, no, you don't have to wear a, a, a suit and a tie. And that's okay. It's wonderful to wear that. Uh, it's not always necessary, but things are definitely changing in our culture. We see in our text this this morning, the priest, and God had chosen the Aaron to be the father of the priesthood. He and his sons, they were chosen by God. They, didn't nom they weren't nominated by the nation. They didn't volunteer. They didn't appoint themselves. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 28. Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? The answer is yes. I gave to the house of your father all my offspring by fire from the people of Israel. God has chosen Aaron and his sons to be the priest. And God wanted Aaron and the priest to dress the part. So in today's text, that we're going to see, God is going to teach Moses how he wanted the high priest to dress as they serve God and represent the people in the tabernacle. And we saw last week the tabernacle and what does it teach us? It teach us about, teaches us about God's condescension, about his eminence. God humbled himself, and he drew near to his people, the nation of Israel. He made it possible for them to draw near to him. He gave Israel his house plans, if you will, and they were to construct this tabernacle that would be mobile, that would move with the camp as they're headed towards the promised land, they were to build the tabernacle with a courtyard of 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. And in it were the, the altar, the bronze altar where sacrifices were being made. There's also a, a bronze labor there for washing hands. But it's outside. They're made of bronze. Then inside the, the holy place, inside the tent, two rooms. One's a holy place, 30 feet long, 15 feet wide. It contained a lampstand that was always lit a table for the showbread that was changed every Saturday. The priest would come in, they would take the bread, put fresh bread down, they would eat the bread that they took off of it on the, on the Sabbath. And there was an altar there for burning incense. Then you had a veil, and then you had this 15 by 15 by 15 cube of a room called the holy, holy place, the most holy place, right? Right? It contained the Ark of the Covenant. Inside the Ark, there's the Ten Commandments. There's the, the staff that budded, Aaron's staff that budded. And there's a, a jar containing manna. On top of the Ark was the mercy seat, the lid, if you will, for the Ark. On each end was cherubim. And in between those cherubim, that's where God would meet with his people. And one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, the chosen priest, the chosen high priest, would go into the Holy of Holies, take the blood of the altar, of the offering, and, and sprinkle it on the altar, and there, there, make atonement for the nation, for himself and for the nation, and go, thus meet with God. So atonement was made so people could draw near to the Lord, and the Lord wanted his people to draw near and meet with him. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? We haven't seen him dwell with his people since the Garden of Eden. And now house plans have been given. The tabernacle is to be built so God can dwell with his people once again. And they're just feet, within feet of God's presence. But as near as God was to them, we also learn from the tabernacle of God's transcendence. Even though he's close and we can draw near we do so reverently and not casually 
I mean, and the, and the temple teaches us that. I mean, there's a courtyard where all the Israelites would go, but they were forbidden from going into the holy place. Only the priests and the Levites went there to serve in the holy place. And then only one high priest once a year was allowed to go through the veil into the holy of holies. And so God was near, drawn near to the Lord. But also recognize we do that reverently. We don't do that casually because our God is a holy God Amen. whose ways and thoughts are far above ours. So what do we see in chapter 28? We're given directions for the high priest. Those that serve the Lord, they're to be set apart. Look at verses 1 through 5. Aaron, he's... To be dressed a certain way as the high priest in verse 40, we'll see that his sons, the, the priest, are to be dressed similarly. We'll look at that in just a bit. But these priests are to be set apart. I mean, these are Aaron and his descendants. They're the Levites. They're the only ones that can enter the holy place. They're the only ones that can enter the holy of holies. They're to be set apart, and they're to be set apart in their attire, what they wear. And what they're outfitted with is, is very ornate. It's very expensive. It's not very common. They're to be dressed for the occasion of serving in the temple, serving in the tabernacle, interceding and mediating for the people before the Lord. Verse 2 and 3 tells us that these artisans, these craftsmen, were to make these holy garments for the high priest. And it says, for glory and for beauty. We see that several times in our text. The high priest was the best, man, best dressed man in Israel. And his clothes embodied, in, in a way, embodied the character of God. Psalm 29, verse 2. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And, and it's, it's interesting. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in holy attire, the New American Standard says. They were to make His outfit, His clothing, out of gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen, which is exactly what was used to build and create the tabernacle. Those linen curtains were embroidered with these colored yarns. And as the high priest served, as he had his garb on, everyone knew that he belonged there in the tabernacle. And, and notice the list there in verse 4 of these garments. We're going to look at these real quickly, one by one. You have the, the breast piece, and then the the ephod, and then the robe, the coat. Uh, the coat, you could also, it's also called a tunic, a turban, and a sash. Let's look at the ephod, verses 6 through 14. This one's described, this, this article is described first. It was, a, it was made of gold and blue, purple, scarlet yarns, a fine twisted linen, skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that it may be joined together. What, what, what this is, is really is, it, I don't know, your kids ever do art? They have these smocks that they wear, kind of slips over, and that's what this ephod uh, looked like. It was a sleeveless apron or vest, uh, if you will. It was made of this costly yarn, and on the, the the shoulders here, there were these two onyx stones on each shoulder. And on one shoulder, there were six names engraved, six tribes of Israel. And on the other shoulder, the other six names are engraved. So the, the priest was carrying these tribes on his shoulders, carrying the burdens of these tribes as he entered the tabernacle. And it said it's done for remembrance. So as he goes and he's serving in the temple, you'll see this time and time again, he's going in, he's not doing this for himself, he's doing this for the nation, for each tribe. Carrying those tribes in on my shoulders, carrying their burdens to the Lord. This is the, the, the ephod. 
Like I said, it's like a, a smock, and we're going to show you a picture here in just a, a moment. And then you have the breast piece, and the breast piece is listed first, but here it's described, and it gives it's given the most attention, and I think that's for a reason. That's important. It's kind of like, what do we talk about? Um, you, it, I, talk, I spend most of my time talking about my wife and my kids. Well, why is that? Because that's what's most important in my life, right, and most important to me, right? In my everyday life, that's what I'm going to spend a lot of my time talking about because they are important to me. The breast piece. It's a, it's a pouch that was connected to the, the ephod, and it contained precious stones, 12 in fact. And it's interesting that the, these stones are named, and it's interesting where you find these stones elsewhere in the Scriptures. We'll look at it real quickly. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day you were created, they were prepared. It's, it's interesting. Um, here we see that this being described that filigree is, is one of the words that's used. It's in, it's in a gold setting. So you see those precious stones being mentioned. They were in the Garden of Eden. Also, when Jesus returns, consummation of all things, there's a new heavens and a new earth. The new Jerusalem is going to be decorated with these same stones. Revelation 21, 18 through 21. The wall, this is the new Jerusalem, right? The wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a gate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, I don't know how to pronounce that, chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of single pearl, and the street of the city was a pure gold, transparent as glass. So you see these precious stones mentioned. Garden of Eden, we see them in the New Jerusalem, and here you see them representing the twelve tribes of Israel on the breast piece that's connected to the ephod. Having these names on these precious stones signify the priests represented these nations. This, these tribes, this nation, as they went into the temple to serve. It brought the tribes front and center, reminding God of these names. Verse 29, it brings them to regular remembrance to the Lord. And it's not that God forgets. Does God forget anything? No, he's all-knowing. But what is it doing? It's symbolic, right? He has the nation, that the, the high priest and the priest, as they enter to serve. The high priest, especially with this breastfeed, he has these, the nation, the tribes, on his mind. He's bringing them before God to minister. It's interesting in verse 29 and 30, on his heart is used three different times. He's thinking them, their interests, their needs. It's, he's not coming just to make atonement for himself, which he has to do, but he's coming to serve the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes. And notice on there the Urim and Thummim are also placed in this pouch. Uh, it's the breast. It's called the breast piece of judgment. That's interesting. It's always been interesting to me. In the Old Testament, we see many times decisions were made using the Urim and Thummim. They're like holy dice. I mean, that's, that's kind of that's kind of odd. It's like, um, yeah, it's like dice. It's how God would declare his will to his people. And we don't know how that's done exactly. But the Israelites knew that God would reveal his will this way. We see that um, throughout the scriptures, Proverbs 16, 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision from the Lord. Speaking of God's providence, right? Speaking of God's sovereignty, and then we see it three, th I have three different times that I want to mention today. There's many, many times this is used in the scripture, but uh, several times that God e expresses his will to his people through the, the, pre the high priest as he uses this Urim and Thummim. Numbers 27, 21. This is Joshua. Moses has passed away. Joshua is leading the, uh, the new leader of the nation of Israel. 
And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the people of Israel with him, the whole congregation. So he's getting direction where they should go. God revealing his will, using the Urim and Thummim. Nehemiah chapter 7, this is after... This is uh, after the exiles had left Babylon and they returned to Jerusalem. And they're going to rebuild the city. They're going to rebuild the temple, and that's what they did. But if you remember, the temple in, it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and all the records were destroyed. Well, how do they know who was, who was the priest and who wasn't? Who's of the line? Who's in, uh, uh, a Levite? Who's not? Well, how do they determine who was to serve in, in the temple? Well, they, they used the Urim and Thummim. The gov governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until a priest with Urim and Thummim should arise. So we see that being used there. Uh, another incident where we see it mentioned in Scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 6. This is after God had rejected Saul because of his disobedience and his lack of trusting the Lord. He... He says, um, and when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. And so what does he do? He goes and seeks out the witch of Endor, right, to give him uh, instruction on whether he should go to battle or not. So we see that uh, many times used in the Old Testament. It's, it's not uh, certain how that was used exactly, but this breast piece of decision was used. Now, it wasn't used by the high priest to answer everyday questions, of individuals' problems, like uh, should Caleb take the job offered to him? Should Joshua sell his sheep to Hosea or Jedediah? Well, you wouldn't come and ask the high priest that and him determine um, using the Urim and Thummim whether you should do that individually or not. But these are decisions for the nation, important decisions, that affects the whole nation. And so that's uh, one way God would uh, speak to his people is through using this um, uh, divine means uh, to declare his will. Of course, we know he spoke through dreams. He spoke through the prophets, of course. Um, but the priest, once they determined God's will, would convey that, would share that with uh, the nation. So that's the breast piece. You have the ephod, the breast piece, and then you have the robe. Look at verse 31 through 38. And the robe is, is, um, is blue. And that's the same color as the, the veil separating the holy place from the holy place. Same color. The robe is to be blue. Uh, it, it's under the ephod. And it was one piece. It was like a hoodie, if you will, uh, or a poncho. Some kids don't know what ponchos are. They know what hoodies are. It's like a hoodie. And they put it on, and it would go under the, the ephod. And on the bottom of it, on the hem, were uh, pomegranates and bells. And the bells would make noise uh, to let people know that the priest was um, there. Uh, and it's been said, I know you've heard this, uh, it's been said that uh, they, would, um, they would have the bells on, the hem of the, the robe there of the high priest, and when he would go in on the Day of Atonement, those bells were there uh, to make sure he was moving. Or, you know, and if he wasn't moving and he, he never came out, they would tie a rope on. You've heard this, right? They would tie a rope on him and that way they could drag him out of the Holy Holies because who's going to go in the Holy Holies other than this one person, right? Well, um, you've heard that. I've heard that and I've, I've shared that and, and thought that to be true, but it's not in the Bible. And in fact, it's not anywhere that I could find. And so I would say that it's, I wouldn't really repeat that. Sounds kind of cool, uh, but I wouldn't say that that's biblical. Uh, but it sounds really, really neat. And it, it, it ought to be true, maybe, but I'm not sure if it is or not. So that's not something we want to repeat. But the, the bells on the hem of the, the robe, they, they serve the same purpose. It's kind of like knocking on a door or ringing a doorbell. It lets you know that somebody's coming. And think about this. Um, in those days, the king, you didn't enter the presence of the king unannounced or uninvited, did you? Brings to mind Esther, right? That's what she did. She said, I haven't been invited, but I'm going to go and, and, uh, in the king's presence. And so she took that upon herself, risked her life to do that, right? Well, it kind of serves the same purpose um, as the, the high priest uh, enters that holy place, that holy of holies. 
allows the Lord to know he's coming, he's not, um, he's, he's invited, he's announcing his presence. Um, that's the robe. Look at the turban, uh, verse 36 and 38. This is a headpiece. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engravings of a signet, holy to the Lord. Now think about this. Again, Aaron, James, Aaron didn't uh, uh, appoint himself. He was chosen by the Lord. And then think about him. He, he understood his own sinfulness. Can you imagine? <laughs> he put on a turban and it's got holy to the Lord across it. Um, what an incredible um, job this was for the high priest. But it says on the front of it, holy to the Lord, right across their forehead. And this high priest, they're representing the nation, and he would offer sacrifices first for his own sin and then for the sin of the people. And he did this while wearing this turban with this uh, gold plate saying, Holy to the Lord. He was the intermediator, the, the mediator, if you will, between God and, and Israel. And I was thinking about this while, while I had this on his head, and, and, and what kept coming to my mind is, you hear that phrase, let the blood be on his own head, and that's even, we see that in Scripture. And what does that mean? You know, I'll take responsibility for my actions, right? Let me punish for my own, for my own guilt. And see this man, you know, this high priest having this gold plate, holy to the Lord. And he has an incredible task to go into the Holy of Holies and to make a sacrifice for him and for the nation. So you see this this turban, this headpiece. That's important. And then the coat or the tunic. Sometimes some the ESV says coat. Uh, New American Standard says tunic. Verse thirty nine through forty. And you shall wear the coat or the tunic in checker work of fine linen. And then you shall make a turban of fine linen. And you shall make a sash embroidered with needlework. And so we'll see the picture. Do we have a, a picture um, of this? I know the. Yeah, you'll see. Um, you see the robe there, the coat, the tunic, right? That goes down to the, and they were they were barefooted, right? And we understand that, right? Moses was at the burning bush. Take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. Of course, you're in the, you're in the the tabernacle. You're on holy ground. But then you have the the ephod, this uh, smock, and then here you have the the breast piece with all those 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 four rows of three, representing the tribes. Then you have this turban with the headband on it, um, but this is the this is the get up, if you will, the garments for the high priest. And and think, well, what's the um, what's the significance of this? Uh, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Look at verse forty. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory again and for beauty. Um, and you shall put on Aaron your brother and his sons and him and shall anoint him and ordain him and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. We'll talk about that next week, this consecration of the priest. But look at verse 42. This is kind of interesting. You shall make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place. This is interesting lest they bear guilt and die. You used to, used to hear this. You don't hear it as much now. You used to hear it when you're younger. You're going somewhere and say, hey, make sure you got clean underwear on. This is uh, anointed draws, if you will. <laughs> Kevin, it seems more like box of briefs. Okay, box of briefs that the, the priest had to wear. And we'll, we'll, we'll see why that is. We've already talked about that as they, they walk the step. We'll talk about that later. Um, what's the purpose in this? But it's just to be modest. Make sure there's modesty there. Uh, but it's interesting, verse 43, lest you, they bear guilt and die. Pretty important stuff. They didn't wear these things just as they were told. They would die as they uh, ministered there before the Lord. Um, okay. This is not the most exciting text if you're reading, and as you're reading through it, as Jeff's reading through it, you're like, okay, okay. And this is when you're doing your, some of you are doing chronological Bible reading, you're like, you get to this part, and you're just kind of doing the fast reading skim kind of thing. Um, what's the significance for our lives? Well, 
let's talk about that. I think there's some things we can learn from this text. And, and as you do expository preaching, you preach through all of Scripture because, Adam, all Scripture is profitable and it's useful. And I think we'll see after we finish here today, this is, is helpful. Well, let's think about us as New Covenant believers. We don't live under the Old Covenant, right? We're New Covenant believers, and we just think about, we know that all the promises of God have their yes in Christ, right? And, and every all of these things in the Old Covenant are pointing us to what's to come, right? To Jesus. Of course, Jesus come. He's made atonement for sin. He's lived. He's died. He's risen from the dead. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father where he intercedes and mediates for his church. And one day, he's going to come and he's going to make all things right. He's going to come in judgment. He's going to come in glory. And there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. And his church will reign with him forever and forever. But Jesus is our high priest in the new covenant. And in the old covenant, the high priest made himself presentable by wearing these special clothes, these sacred garments, if you will, to give him um, glory and, and beauty. But unfortunately, even though this high priest, when he, you saw him, you knew this was the holy garments on this high priest. It was a, not just a high honor, but an incredible task he had. But unfortunately, the inward realities of the priest's life never matched the outward splendor of his clothes because the high priest, of course, was always sinful. In fact, some of these men mentioned here with Aaron, his boys, what happened to them? You remember? They were killed by the Lord because of their sin. And we see that with Eli. His boys were struck down because of their sinful lifestyle. But enter Jesus Christ, right? The writer of Hebrews asks in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11, if perfection could be attained through the Levitical priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come? See, the, the old priesthood under the old covenant was lacking. And the high priest, what are they? They're a symbol. But Jesus is the reality. Jesus does all the things for us that the high priest did for Israel. He bears the burden of our sin on his shoulders. He carries our concerns close to his heart, representing us before God, and he does his priestly work as he stands in perfect holiness. So we are holy to the Lord. Jesus came in holiness and in glory and in beauty, so there's no need to wear all the elaborate breastplates and the ephod and when sacrifice was made, it was himself that he offered once for all. This priest is perfect, holy, without spot or blemish. He is more beautiful than anything in all creation because he shines with the glory of God's divine nature because he is, in fact, God himself. We have a perfect high priest. As the song said, whose name is love. He came to make atonement for us. Once for all. Isn't it amazing? I think about, I, I, I say this a lot, and I think about it. This is probably uh, one of the more profound things that I ponder and think about. Because of what Christ has done for us, the church. Think about this. We are as righteous as we will ever be. Think about what Christ did as he made atonement for sin. Josh, you'll never be more righteous than you are right now. Isn't that something? Think about as, as Jamie, he led us in a time of confession. I had kind of shared with him before these last few days. It's like I've just been kind of going through the motions, just kind of in a 
you know, even as I was preparing and asking the Lord to help me and, and, and prepare, and it's like I was just going through the motions, you know, and I was just kind of in the flesh and just kind of going through. The, didn't really feel like I was remaining or walking with the Lord. And we all can, can say, man, this week I've boom, 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 how we disobey the Lord and displease the Lord and grieve God. But because of what Christ has done, this, this high priest, what he's done for us, we're never more righteous than we'll, we're more righteous now than we ever will be. Think about that. Positionally, right? Because Christ has done, obeyed in every way. He's obeyed completely for us. And he gives us his righteousness. That's, that ought to motivate us to obey. That ought to motivate us to please him. We don't have to work. We don't have to do, 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 do to please him. No, Christ has done the work for us. He's kept the law for us. He's holy and he's perfect. And that record that he has has been given to us as believers. That's amazing. That's what should motivate us to please him and to obey him and to sacrifice for him. So we remember Christ, our great high priest, who now is at the right hand of the Father. And he's not standing, he's seated, meaning what? The work's been done. And now what does he do? He intercedes for us, reminding the Father of his record that we now have. How else does this text apply to us? I think as this, we see over and over verse 29 and 30, it talks about on the heart, on the heart, on the heart. And, and as the high priest come in, he, he came in the, the holy place. He came in the holy of holies. He had those, those onyx stones with the tribe on it. He had each tribe name written on these precious stones here. And it keeps it's talking about on his heart. He's bringing the nation. He's representing the nation. He's bringing the nation before the Lord, representing the nation. He's doing this on behalf of the nation. And I think about how we as Christians, how we too need to have people and people's needs, people's souls on our hearts. We need to be bringing that to the Lord regularly, asking the Lord for, for help for, on behalf of sinners who are yet to repent. Think about this week. We're having a, a wildlife supper. And the whole idea is, hey, we're bringing a guy from Idaho to preach. And he's going to preach the gospel. He's driving a long way to preach. Just bring one friend that doesn't know the Lord. Attempt to bring a friend that doesn't know the Lord. You don't have to cook. You don't have to prepare. You don't have to do anything. Just bring one person that you, maybe is not in church, maybe you think that doesn't know the Lord. That's not a lot of work. Just bring one person. And who knows? If you bring them, we're going to do our best to, to make sure they hear the gospel. Who knows? Maybe they'll be saved. You got anybody that's lost, that lives around here, that just might come and eat, even if they don't eat wild game? We'll have fried catfish. Who doesn't like that? And if you say, if I tell them it's a wild game supper, they may not come. Okay, tell them it's a catfish supper because it's going to be. We're going to have catfish and get them to come. Hey, you like catfish? Hey, free catfish. Come to Beaver on Saturday night, 6 o'clock. We're going to preach first and eat second. We live in the, the new covenant. We're a kingdom of priests. A holy nation, right? That's what the church is. We should have others on our hearts and minds, and we should be interceding for the lost. Thirdly, and you're probably hoping I come back to this, we don't have the Urim and Thummim, right, in the New Covenant. And sometimes we wish we did. I wish I had some holy dice. How many of you, How many, of, Jim, you're going to remember this. How many of you had the eight ball? You remember the old eight ball that tell you your fortune? Yeah, yeah. Like, I wish I had one of the things that really worked. Pam, you remember those? The little things you'd shake up and ask a question and say, well, what's the answer? It was, I don't know who came up with that. Um, 
we sometimes wish we could have one of those things, Caitlin, where we say we have to make a decision, and it's like a really important decision that's going to affect maybe our lives and the lives of our family. And like, I just wish I knew what I, what I ought to do. Should I take this job? How should I invest this money? Where should I go to school? Should I buy this property or should I not? Should I buy this car or should I buy that one? I want to buy the car that's going to last, like for, that's going to drive like 250,000 miles before it breaks down, right? God, is it this car or is it this car, right? Sometimes you just wish you had somebody telling us those things. You had a way to know what's best. But now under the new covenant, God doesn't speak through Urim, Urim and Thummim. He didn't speak through prophets. He didn't speak that way. How does he speak? Hebrews chapter 1. We have that text, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. It's really, really clear. It couldn't be any clearer. More clear than this. Long ago, speaking like old covenant times, right? Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So he's, now he's spoken through Christ. And you say, well, Jesus is not here in the flesh. No, but he's given us his word, which we have, right? And then we see throughout the scriptures, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. How do we know God's will? What's God's will for our lives? For this is the will of God. What's the God's will? That your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not in passion of lust like the Gentile. Gentile, anytime you see that word, think lost person who do not know God. Hey, if you're, if you're thinking about being sexually intimate with somebody that you're not married to, it's really, really obvious that's not God's will for your life. And so by doing that, you're rebelling against the Lord, right? First Thessalonians chapter 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You being the Thessalonians, right? The believers there in Thessalonica, but wow. God will for you and for me as well. How does God speak to us? We we taught through this all last semester in the fall. On Wednesday nights, how does God speak? And we're like, man, does God speak this way, that way? How does God speak? And some of the, some of the ways we, we know, we, in the fir first day, we said, how does God speak to you? And we had people write down things. And most, most people were, they would say, God's word. And that's spot on. And some people say, well, you know, other things. But whatever you say other than God's word is, is going to be subjective. I'm praying. I just had this feeling. I had this feeling, right? We can say I have this feeling about just about anything. And you can't really prove that that's the Lord. I'd stay clear of that. Or we have these ridiculous things that happen. And they happen all the time. I've been praying, asking, make a decision about da 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 you know. Should I marry so-and-so? Man, is this a person that I ought to marry? And I'm driving down the road and had a detour sign. A tree was over the road and I had a detour so it detoured me and guess the, the, the first road I turned on was the name of the road was Windy Drive thank you God you've answered my prayers I'm going to marry Windy people discern God's will like that that's real scary don't do that that's not how we do, that's not how we discern the will of God for our lives how do we know God's will the only non-subjective way we know God's will is read his word. Let me, let me read this. Um, 
It says we read God's Word because what God's Word is, God's Word is truth. It never changes. And now we have the Spirit of Christ living in us. And you know what the Spirit of Christ, Christ does? It illuminates the Word of God. Helps us to understand it. Helps us to know how to apply it to our lives. So what do we do? And that's one thing we, that's our heartbeat here at our church. We want to sing truth. You recognize we get here, we sing truth. And then in between songs, we read a lot of scripture and people are teaching what? Truth. And I love the way we do things because it's a teaching moment. It's not like, all right, we're going to sing three hymns and take up the offering. No, it's a, it's a teaching time. Teaching truth. It's got to be Bible. It's got to be Bible. It's got to be Bible. Right? And even things we read, we read books. I tell people all the time, our small group believers, we're always, as a matter of fact, guys, I got, I got a pile of books on my desk for you. We need to be reading good stuff. But what do we do? We always read whatever we read written by man. What do we do? We compare it to the scriptures because this is true. We know. This may or may not be. God speaks to us through his word. He loves you. You're his treasured possession. He carries you close to his heart. God will not let you wander off in the wrong direction if you're seeking him. We have his perfect word, the illumination of his word by the Holy Spirit. We have the guidance of his daily providence. I pray this all the time. All the time, Lord, direct my steps. I pray this for you. I pray this for our small group leaders. I pray this for our church. Direct our steps. As I think about you at work, I pray that all the time. Reagan's work and direct our steps. Direct our steps. This daily divine providence, he directs us. And we'll know his will. Philip Reich, and he, in his commentary on the book of Exodus, he, he writes this in a letter to a friend, the great Puritan preacher and hymn writer, John Newton, asks and answers the question, but how then may the Lord's guidance be expected? In other words, how do we know God's will for our lives? In general, he guides and directs his people by affording them an answer to prayer, the light of his Holy Spirit, which enables them to understand and love the scriptures. The word of God is to furnish us with just principles, right apprehensions to regulate our judgments and affections, and thereby influence and direct our conduct. They who study the scriptures in a humble dependence upon divine teaching are gradually formed into a spirit of submission to the will of God and discover the nature and duties of their several situations and relations in life. By treasuring up doctrines, precepts, promises, examples, and exhortations of Scripture in their minds and daily comparing themselves with the rule by which they walk, they grow into an habitual frame of spiritual wisdom. How do we know God's will? We're not throwing the holy dice. We're not waiting on a prophet to tell us. We read and study his holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. So may I ask you by way of application, how are you determining God's will for your life? Are you studying the scriptures? Are you drawing near, memorizing scriptures? Are you meditating on it day and night? That's how we know God's will. If you say, Pastor Shane, I want, to, I want to know the Lord's will for my life concerning this. I might say, tell you different things, but I'll say, read your Bible. Intake of the Word, intake of the Word. As we, as we take in His Word, what do we do? We, we know Him, we know His will, right? So that's part of our application for today. Remember Jesus, He's our great high priest. Aaron, the high priestly order, that family line, the Levites, they're the symbol, and Jesus is the reality. We live under the new co in the new covenant era. Maybe you're here and you've explained about what Jesus has done. Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you discern 
you don't really care about God's will because you've been living for yourself all these years. I tell you, God loves, loves his people. He's created you. He's given you uh, an emptiness in your heart that only he can feel. He set eternity in your heart. If you're empty and wondering, there's got to be more life. Yes, it is. He wants you to know him, and you can only know him just as that high priest would go in and make atonement for sin so the nation of Israel could dwell with God. Jesus, the great high priest, has made atonement. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross, made a, a sacrifice. That sacrifice was himself, this holy unblemished lamb of God he bore the wrath of the father he was buried on the third day he rose from the dead some 40 days later he ascended to the father one day he's coming back to judge sinners and to live forever with his church if you've yet to repent and trust Christ's work on the cross as your own I encourage you to do so today God loves you he wants sinners to repent. And so I'm encouraging you today, repent and trust Christ's work on the cross as your own. He died, he rose from the dead, so sinners could be reconciled to God. And so God could once again dwell with you. See, all of us who are a part of the church, all of us who are believers who've repented and trusted Christ, the scripture says that we're a temple of the Holy Spirit. God seals us, Ephesians chapter 1. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. God wants to dwell with you. Will you repent and allow him to dwell with you? Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge your goodness. Thank you for your word. Lord, it's, sometimes your word is, it gets a little dry. We don't know really what to do with some of this, but we're thankful for your holy inspired word. We're thankful for the high priest and their role they played. We're thankful for how that high priest points us to Jesus and he fulfills all of these Old Testament promises. We're thankful that Jesus did make atonement for sin so that sinners like me could know you and dwell with you. And we're thankful for the promise we have in the Holy Spirit that guarantees our inheritance that one day we'll be with you forever. And all our troubles and all our sin will be done away with. And we'll be with you forever and ever and ever and ever. Father, if there's anybody here that's yet to repent, I pray that you would do a work in them. Father, you grant repentance and faith to them even now. For the church, Father, may we, may we be burdened for lost people, and be interceding for them regularly. May we work at getting people here for Saturday as they uh, are going to hear the gospel. Father, may we remember that you are a great high priest and live like those who've been redeemed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.